on behalf of the Jesuit Conference, which brings together the very many Jesuit provinces in which Howard Gray served, we welcome you to this memorial mass for Father Howard. And we offer especially to you, Marge, his dear sister, and his family, our heartfelt condolences. Marge, I've never had a conversation with your brother where he didn't talk about you and say how much he loved you. And many people have come here today for him and for you. It's hard to count them all, but let me just give you a sampling of who's here today. We know that he studied at uh, St. Ignatius High School, and he worked at Georgetown University, and he worked at John Carroll University, and the presidents of those institutions are here with us. We know that he worked at Columbia Air Center, and at the Western School of Theology, and at Boston College, and superiors and former faculty of those institutions are here with us. We know he is well for spirituality at the Jesuit Retreat House in Parma, as well as at Manresa Jesuit Retreat House in Bloomfield Hills. His spirit was infectious, and directors and members of those institutions are here with us. And Marge, as if the world couldn't get any smaller, your brother's prom date from 70 years ago <laughs> is here today with us. She went to Beaumont, in Ignatius Beaumont. Howard taught us something. Many of us gather not from these institutions, but from our love of Ignatian spirituality. And he always taught us that we should caution between performance and encounter. We do not come here to perform before the Lord. We come here to encounter the Lord. So let us open our hearts, our minds, and our souls, so that as our great teacher taught us, we might encounter the Lord in the mystery of God and in the life and the witness of how we pray. And now I invite Father Bradley Schaefer, former provincial of the Chicago province, to offer words of remembrance. The theologian John Shea says that God made us because God loves stories. And if God made us because God loves stories, creation has been an incredible success. And I'd ask you right now, you've already been doing this, I'm sure, among yourselves, to pick one or two stories about Howard that are nearest and dearest to you and reflect on how it is that God worked through this good man into your life. I thought of a couple. One is on Sunday night, I happened to be at the hospital, and Howard was on the ventilator, and and unconscious, and I said, well, you know, Howard, you used to fall asleep regularly in my conferences with you. Um, so this is probably good, and I'm gonna make my last confession to you because I kinda know what you'd say. I didn't pick up his hand to give me myself absolution, but, but we did go through the confession. I said, one last time, because I always knew that you would be attentive to me, that you would reverence me, and that you would care for me and brought God to me in that particular way. And I suspect that's what you will reflect on as you listen to all those stories. The other one was a, was a much different context that the 34th General Congregation, Howard and I were delegates and Howard labored on one of the decrees and I was basically his amanuensis. The, the committee I worked on published one, a one sentence decree, we were done. So I was his typist basically. So we would get together and Howard wrote everything longhand. We went through, we did all this, and he labored on this. And it went to the aula, the congregation, and this pompous British Jesuit takes the microphone and screams, words, 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 and then proceeds to rip apart the decree, followed by any number of people. And you could see Howard sink further and further in his chair. So when we got off, I said, how are you doing? Well, he made a couple of snide remarks about a few of those Jesuits, which was Howard's way. And then he sat down and redid the decree. He labored at that. There was an incredible humility. It, his, the whole point of his life was, where is God in the midst of all this? What is God trying to say to us? And he became an extremely important instrument at that 34th General Congregation. David Brooks uh, recently um, told Howard was talking with the folks at Manresa and said, he was quoting David Brooks, the, the, the columnist, and said, it occurred to me that there were two sets of virtues, the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the skills you bring to the marketplace. The eulogy virtues are the ones that are talked about at your funeral. Whether you were kind, brave, 
honest, or faithful? Were you capable of deep love? That's what you will hear in the stories you reflect on and share with each other. This man who listened, was attentive, was wise, who was put into situations to, to ease things or to hire people or to, to diffuse delicate situations, in remarkable ways did it with great, great care. Howard's deepest quality, it seems to me, that I love most was reverence. He had an amazing reverence for everything that he was about. You know, he was attentive. He, 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 there was this uh, piece he wrote in, in one of the spirituality journals about attention, reverence, and devotion, saying that that's really the heart of Ignatian spirituality. That's the heart of, of our constitutions and the Society of Jesus. Attention, reverence, and devotion. And that's really the call that you and I receive by virtue of our baptism. So, as we honor this great man who really reflected God's love, let's be attentive to all those people that God puts in our lives. Let's be reverent and honor all that God presents to us. And let's be devoted to the mission that God gives each one of us uniquely. At the uh, memorial service in Detroit uh, Thursday night, Tony Moore was quoted. I don't know, Tony, if I'll get this word right or not, but it was, Howard, you know, when I die, I hope I meet the God you have preached about. When I die, I hope to meet, because that God is a God of love. Let's honor this man. Let's be the face of God to others that we're called to do. Let's be, as best we can, attentive, reverent, and devoted. Let us pray. Here with faith are our prayers, which we humbly offer, O Lord, for the salvation of the soul of Howard, your servant and priest, that he who devoted a faithful ministry to your name may rejoice in the perpetual company of your saints. For our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Micah. He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. If God is for us, who can be against us? It is possible that he who did not spare his own son, but handed him over for the sake of us, all will not grant us all things besides? Who shall bring a charge against God's chosen ones? God, who justifies? Who shall condemn them? Jesus Christ, who died, or rather was raised up, who is at the right hand of God, and who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Trial, or distress, or persecution, or hunger, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? Yet in all this we are more than conquerors, because of him who has loved us. For I am certain that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities, neither the present nor the future, nor powers, neither height nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God that comes to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke. Just then a lawyer stood up to ask Jesus, Teacher, he said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. 
Which of these three do you think was neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him compassion. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Wishing to justify himself, the lawyer asked, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the robbers who stripped him, beat him, and left him for half dead. Then down came a priest who crossed to the other side and hurried along, as did a Levite. Then came a Samaritan who saw him, was moved with compassion, bent over him, poured oil and wine into his wounds to soothe and disinfect them as best he could, bound them up, probably tearing one of his own garments to do so, and took him to an inn where he cared for him. Then he told the innkeeper to do the same thing until he returned and he would pay whatever the care had cost. With that, Jesus asked, who do you think was neighbor to that poor man? The lawyer replied, the one who showed him compassion. Jesus said, go and do like." This is one of the most familiar stories from the Bible, and even people who have never heard it or read it know what the expression Good Samaritan means. It is the story that Howard Gray requested be read and preached upon at his funeral. The story of the Good Samaritan is therefore Howard's last word to us. It is his farewell message to us. It is the story he wants us to take to heart and to remember him by. I think Howard would be pleased if we took a clue from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and contemplated each of the persons in the story by asking ourselves with which one we identify. Maybe with the smug and self-satisfied lawyer who could rattle off the right answer to religious questions but did not dare ask himself what the answers might mean for the life he lived. Maybe with the priest who hurried along, perhaps to attend an important religious service, or with the Levite who had to close a big business deal, or perhaps just did not care. May it not be with the robbers whose livelihood came from the exploitation of others. If you are like me, you have every one of those persons in some measure dwelling in your soul and knocking at the door of your heart. If you are like me, you want to keep them at bay. If you are like me, you want the Samaritan, the man moved by compassion to dwell in your heart and guide your steps. You realize that only if the compassion of the Samaritan rule your heart can you call yourself a Catholic or a Christian. You realize that only if the compassion of the Samaritan rule in your heart can you call yourself a human being. Ah, I almost forgot. There's another person in the story. The man who was robbed, stripped, beaten, and left for half dead. The man who was helpless and covered with gaping wounds. The man who was so crushed by the punishment he suffered that he lay there silent, probably only half aware of the dire condition he was in. A pitiful figure. The man who desperately needed another to help him with his wounds and give him succor. Do you in any way identify with him and maybe bear wounds and need comfort and healing? Perhaps wounds you inflicted upon yourself and perhaps even find yourself continuing to inflict them as if that pattern is part of you. I do. I identify with that wretched man. 
and I know that I'm not alone in doing so. In fact, I believe that wounded man, in some degree, great or small, lives in each one of us. But even if he does not, each of us needs comfort, understanding, and encouragement. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, calls the church a field hospital. What a beautiful image that is, and how consonant with the story of the Good Samaritan, the story Howard presents to us this morning. If the church is a field hospital, I have known a place within the church where both the badly wounded and the lightly wounded have flocked for many decades. I'm speaking, of course, of Howard Gray. What an extraordinary life he had as a Jesuit. The day he died, the province set out a little biography that listed the important positions he held, including provincial of the Detroit province, where he was not only esteemed as provincial, but loved as provincial. Not a small achievement in the Society of Jesus. <laughs> Respected and loved, yes, but he was also a fun provincial. The fun part only enhanced the respect and the love part. What the list of positions does not reveal is how creative Howard was in them, even though he did not choose them himself, but accepted them as assignments from superiors. The superiors sometimes placed him in them when the enterprise or institution was in danger and needed a firm, clear-sighted, and imaginative leader. I can honestly say that in every instance, he left those institutions or enterprises in better shape than when he found them. Even though it cost him dearly, he could be tough when he believed toughness was called for. But it was a toughness born of love, not of self-righteousness. Howard was, as Brad mentioned, a key player in the rescue of Jesuit spirituality from the moralism into which it had largely fallen over the course of the centuries, and in promoting Ignatian spirituality, whose blossoming we experience today. He was one of the first to promote the individual directed retreat, and he helped establish programs to teach others how to be compassionate and prudent guides for those making such retreats. He opened the program to lay men and lay women. Today, we take such things for granted, but we need to realize that they constitute a significant turning point in the history of Christian spirituality. That was Howard, the public person. Then there was the human being we all knew. There is so much that could be said, but if I say simply that Howard was a deeply affectionate person, I have hit upon one of his deepest traits. He loved his sister Marge and considered her his best friend. They spoke on the phone almost every day. He loved his nieces and nephews and their families, and he followed their careers with interest and concern. He formed friendships easily and quickly, but never superficially. Once his friend, always his friend. He and I were friends for over 70 years, since we were teenagers, and I consider his friendship one of the most precious blessings of my life. We shared gossip, <laughs> of which Howard was a reliable and inexhaustible source. <laughs> We bantered and teased and feigned indignation at one another's foibles. You might gather some insight into the quality of our friendship if I tell you that sometimes with me, he began a conversation by asking the enduring question, do you know what's wrong with you? <laughs> Howard looked, he saw, he loved. A Jesuit who for years has been engaged in a courageous and indeed life-threatening ministry wrote me the other day when he heard of Howard's death. 
He said, nothing prepared me better for the ministry I have been engaged in for over 30 years than the affection Howard gave me and showed me how to extend to others. He was a tender glance of God, empowering us all to be that tender glance in the world. That was the gift that drew people to Howard with their darkest secrets, their deepest wounds, and their highest hopes. They came to the field hospital he called spiritual direction, and there they found balm for their wounds and comfort for their souls. To that hospital came bishops, university presidents, students, faculty, staff, countless Jesuits, sundry others, and at least one cardinal. Several weeks ago, Howard was at Georgetown University, where he gave a marvelous lecture. In it, he quoted a passage from the spiritual diary of Blessed Peter Faber, one of the founding members of the Society of Jesus, along with St. Ignatius. The passage goes like this. With great devotion and new depth of feeling, I hoped for and begged this from God, that it might be given me to be the servant and minister of Christ the Consoler, the minister of Christ the Helper, of Christ the Healer, the Enricher and the Strengthener. Thus it would happen that even I might be able through him to help many, to console, liberate, and give them courage, and thus bring help to each and every one of my neighbors whomsoever. What better description could there be of the life of our beloved Howard, that little guy, that great man? We mourn his loss. But as we turn now to the Eucharist, which is the liturgy of thanksgiving and the sacrament that comforts and strengthens us in our sadness, we ask the Lord to welcome Howard into his kingdom to embrace him, to kiss him, to put a ring on his finger and the best robe on his shoulders, and then to introduce him to all the angels and saints in that blessed place where the singing and dancing goes on day and night, 24-7, forever and ever, world without end. Amen. God, the Almighty Father, has raised Christ, his Son, from the dead. With confidence now, as we pray for Howard, we ask the Lord to save all his people, living and dead. The response to each petition is, Lord, hear our prayer. For Howard, who in baptism was given the pledge of eternal life, that he now may be received by the Lord, whom he served so well into the company of the saints. We pray to the Lord. Lord For our brother Howard, who served at the table of the Lord as a priest of the Society of Jesus, that he may be given a place in the liturgy of heaven. We pray to the Lord. Lord For Howard's family, loved ones, and friends, that they may be consoled in their grief by the Lord, who wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. We pray to the Lord. Lord for Howard's brothers in the Society of Jesus and for all of their lay colleagues, 
especially those who share in the ministry of the spiritual exercises and in other aspects of Ignatian spirituality, that they may continue to be inspired by the manner in which God blessed the work of Howard Gray. We pray to the Lord. For all who have fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face, we pray to the Lord. For all of us assembled here to worship in faith as we pray for Howard, that we, we may be gathered together again one day in God's kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord hear our God, our shelter and our strength, we listen with great love to the cries of your people. May the prayers we offer today for your servant Howard and for all of our departed brothers and sisters. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cleanse them of all their sins and grant them fullness of redemption. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has gone. 
that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed and not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. In a similar way when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of A mystery of faith.
Savior's command informed by divine teaching we hear to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And be us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessing over the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the name of the Father, and the Lord, and the Son, and Jesus Christ, who said to apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, and live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Let us pray. Having received the sacrament of salvation, we employ your kindness, O God, for power of your servant and priest, that as you made him a sword of your mysteries on earth, so you may bring him to be nourished by their truth and reality as unveiled in heaven. Through Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. It was 87 years ago this month that Howard was born here in Cleveland. How fitting that his funeral is here in Cleveland. And it was here in the Diocese of Cleveland that Howard and his beloved sister Marge received their sacraments of Christian initiation. It was here in the care of this dear diocese that Howard came to know and love the Lord. And as Howard grew to know the Lord more through this least society of Jesus, Howard never forgot the impact and the importance of the Diocese of Cleveland in his vocation. We're so blessed to have with us today the ninth Bishop of Cleveland, Bishop Anthony Michael Pillar. Bishop, I ask you now to share a few words. So, Margaret, I just want to say to you, you had a very special relationship. It's still there. It'll be a little different. It's still there and even better. Even better. You've got an intercessor. Keep calling him up every night. Keep talking to him. And I'm sure if I know Oliver, he'll talk back. <laughs> so, that's a great, cons a great consolation of our faith. We will be together again, still together again. It's eternal life. It never ends. So stay close to him and the whole thing. Uh, I'm sure, like every other priest, family is a big part of who Howard was. He didn't become the person he is without the love that you shared with him and without the community that he was part of. As I thank Howard for the wonderful gift he was to the Diocese of Cleveland, a blessing to many, many people over the years. I thank all of the Jesuits. It's been a blessing in our diocese to have you this brother priest. And I pray that God bless you all and get Howard and the rest. Father John O'Malley sent in his homily, Father Howard Gray served as provincial of the Detroit province of the Society of Jesus. And we are blessed to have with us the provincial of the new United States Midwest province of the Society of Jesus. He was Howard's last provincial that he will offer 